Hey YouTube, Mentored One here. Welcome to the Darwin Pawn Show. For those fellow geeks out there who have been waiting for me to do more Darwin Pawn videos, you'll have a nerdgasm uh, when you hear what I got in store for you. Or maybe not, it might be overreaching there. For those of you not familiar with Darwin Pawn, let me give you a brief rundown. It is an artificial life simulation. It is not a game, so if you're looking for something that is uh, gamey to watch, it's not. It's more of a science experiment. Um, there are creatures that live in this petri dish. Uh, these creatures are called swimmers. Each swimmer has uh, like 10 or 12 uh, genetic traits that are saved in a DNA file. This determines their physical characteristics like uh, body shape, uh, number of joints, flexibility, speed, all that stuff. And it is modeled using real uh, physics. Fluid dynamics equations determine it moving through this medium in the petri dish, which is like a green goo. So their goal is to eat and reproduce. So the fittest one for a particular environment will get to the food first, will get to their mates first. You can tweak the parameters of the Petri dish, such as how fast food regenerates, um, how much energy it takes to move through the medium, how much calories are in food. You can also edit the genes of any of the swimmers, and you can tweak any parameter in the environment or the genes at any time during the simulation. There aren't a lot of parameters, but there is a lot of variability. So it does what it does well. It's a very limited environment, but it does it very well. And some of the, uh, it, it's a fun to watch. If you're a geek and you like science stuff, uh, this is really good. It's not really evolution because it's actually finding the best type of swimmer suited for the environment. It doesn't really evolve beyond the one most fit. And there's different forms it can take. Uh, so that's the gist of it. We're going to be running a long term. It's going to be called the Darwin Pond Show. So this is for, you know, people who are looking for it and for newbies. The Darwin Pond Show is going to be arranged like a show, seasons and episodes. Um, each one will run probably, each season will probably run about 15 to 20 episodes. They'll be 15 minutes apiece. The goal is to get to a certain time tick, which uh, through my personal experiments have shown that about 500,000 time ticks, which is uh, roughly, I don't know, a couple hours maybe of recording time is what it takes to find the dominant species for any particular environment, assuming that you don't tweak the environment. Uh, with this show, I don't intend to, to mess with the environment once it's up and running. Um, we're going to let it run to the half million tick mark and save the, the season finale. We'll be saving the dominant species in the pond. There should only be one at that point. And then we'll, at the, in the season finale, we're going to have a little shock. We're going to introduce a parasite that I have evolved or rather cause to get to the point where it is artificially. I've intervened, I've created environments. So this thing's a nasty little bugger that I use to test, test out with. It usually destroys anything that I put in its presence. So we'll let something naturally evolve without any intervention from us, and then we'll save it and then introduce this parasite in the finale. And at the beginning of a new season, I'm going to put a mating pair of the dominant species from our previous season into a new pond with a new batch of random swimmers. And we'll edit the parameters of the pond to create a whole new environment and see how the previous season species does uh, in comparison to a new batch. And that'll pretty much be the cycle I'm going to go with. Uh, unless you guys have any suggestions or changes, I'll, of course, take that into account. So we're going to build up dominant species uh, each season, and we're going to have them face the parasite at the end of the season. And in each case, we're going to save all the creatures along the way. So we'll collect the library, you know, season one species, season two species, and so on. And it may be that the season one species comes to dominate season two, the season two pond, or it may be that a new one emerges, or it may be some sort of a hybrid between a new one that arises and the previous one that won. So that's the experiment that we're going to run, and it literally is going to be a science experiment. We're going to play the role of scientists who are observing, tracking, noting, discussing. Uh, there'll be commentary in the episode, just a forewarning. If you don't like commentary, put some music on, mute the video. Uh, you can watch. I'll be zooming in, following along different things that are happening, uh, making note of things. So if you're interested in this type of a science experiment, I welcome you aboard. If it doesn't sound like your cup of tea, um, don't know what to tell you. For those who are interested in, in trying out Darwin's Pond, if you do a search for Google on Google for Darwin Pond uh, 2005, I think it was, it came out, or in Windows 95, I don't remember. Either way, Darwin Pond should bring you to the website. It's uh, Mr. Ventrella is the guy who wrote the program, and you can find a lot of data on there. Um, if you're interested in fluid dynamics, which is the physical aspects, the physics governing what's going on, you can do a search for fluid dynamics and find all the math behind that if that's your thing. 
All right, so that's all I have in the way of introduction. So without further ado, let us begin Season 1, Episode 1 of the Darwin Pond Show, and we're going to be doing a random genesis. Okay, so without further ado, we'll set up an empty pond. And we're going to go to the ecology, which is the environment of the pond. And uh, I'm going to put everything in the middle for the first season. I want everything on like a median level. Okay, so basically just controls, you know, the food calories, how much it costs to mate, how much they need to eat to regenerate their life, etc. All right, so we need to put some food in so the food generation can start. And we'll just drop in a bunch of random food everywhere because it'll auto automatically populate based on the settings of the, the pond. And I actually want to max out the food in the beginning, which is 999 food. So we're going to turn the rate all the way up just to let it populate first. There's no swimmers in the pond yet. And you can see in the graph in the top left, the green bar is the amount of food, the white bar is the number of swimmer population. So the food will cap out at 999. As you can see, it's spreading all over the pond. <coughs> and should be just about maxed out. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be adding in, and we're going to shut off the food generation first. There we go back down to normal rate good everything's normal we're not going to touch that anymore now so we're going to pick the random swimmer tool which is right here and that's going to randomly assign a random dna file to a swimmer we'll zoom in an area going to drop in probably about 100 150 swimmers now it's very rare that i'll have a randomly generated swimmer uh, survive and thrive uh, i've had more ponds that go extinct than i have successes but because i've already kind of done something like this in advance it is possible and in this case since i recorded it in advance i already know that it's going to happen which is rare so this is a this is a rare treat that we're going to see um we had about 150 swimmers in this little space that we zoomed into and these are all randomly generated some real freaks in there already you can see All right, so we'll zoom out so you can see the whole pond, and we can see we populated the center of it, and now the fun begins. And again, we're not going to intervene at all. We're just going to be zooming in, studying populations as they emerge, uh, keeping our eye on ones that might look interesting, promising, etc. And it'd probably be, I mean, it's not going. I don't think anything's going to jump out at us right away, but we're looking for swimmers who might be able to hone in on food and turn their body appropriately. The ones with the colored dots, that black thing poking out, that's the head or the proboscis. And the dot on the end is like an egg or a sperm or whatever. So they're looking for a mate when you see a dot. And if you don't see a dot, they're looking for food because they need to get up the calories necessary to reproduce. And in this case, they're all looking to reproduce because the food was abundant and it was right next to them. So they, they can't do much. Look at this maniac breakdancing over here. And the, as you can see, the movements, it's not, it's like the number of limbs, the joints, the flexibility of the joint, the angle the joints move at, how fast the joints move, all of that's their DNA file. And tweaking a parameter just a little bit can have dramatic changes from the experiments that I've done. Even a, like a tiny, tiny fraction of a change can alter the way the whole creature moves because they all interact with each other. So changing the angle of the joint, you know, will affect uh, if it moves at a fast rate, that's going to have a profound effect if it moves 10 or 15 degrees more than it did before. And that's the type of changes that occur. So what you, and they'll pass on their genes to their offspring. Oh, there is mutation in here too. Uh, you will see random mutation. Most of it is fatal or the creature will go extinct. But obviously, every once in a while, you get that mutation that gives it a benefit. And that's, that's where it mimics the survival of the fittest natural selection very well. Nothing jumping out at me yet. A couple, I've got quite a few die-offs already, uh, down to 136, so 14 have died already. 
you can see the food is pretty much holding at maximum because not a lot of critters are able to find um, to, to seek out the food fast enough and I think we're gonna have a real massive die-off here soon well we get a couple that are moving their way in a more or less straight direction and we get these like single limbed creatures pretty efficient motion if uh, the angles are a little warped there but Look at that guy with the green and blue tips. They're moving pretty good, slowly but surely. Paddling. Where's he going? The color of the dot also denotes the their preferred color of mate, and that's like speciation. That works by... You know, if they prefer a green mate, they'll look at the how much green that a creature has total on its limbs. And the one with the highest amount closest to them will be their preferred mate, and then it'll obviously be selected from there. And you'll see as a species develops, if they all share color patterns, they will swim together towards food and mate together. So you'll see a cluster of them. As they evolve because they'll they'll mates will already be so close that they won't have to travel far to seek a mate um, and creatures that have multi colors obviously are uh, have an advantage when it comes to mating because they you get three or four colors in a mate and there's three or four colors in the possible I, I don't know how many colors there are I, mean, I think there's eight colors possible but either way the more colors the creature has on its limbs the more you know more likely it will uh, be chosen for a mate so that's an advantage in terms of species and repopulation Yeah, there's a lot of freaks that are dying off here. So I've run, I mean, I've run hundreds of experiments. Sometimes I've let it run, I've left it on and just let it run all night, you know, check it in the morning before I go to work or something. And uh, you get some real interesting characters. And I've saved a lot of different species. And I'll, uh, I've done experiments where I'll let it run for two or three days and let it evolve naturally. And then I'll drop in species from other experiments I've done and just watch the mayhem and uh, in a lot of cases it ends up creating hybrids that turn out to be incredibly powerful that guy right there with the pink and the red not exactly good at turning himself in the right direction but uh, he's got some thrust going Boy, a bunch of motley crew up in this hole. So yeah, what? Oh, we got a few in the center there. Look at these guys. Particularly the one on the right there, and the folding and the unfolding of the limbs, and he's more or less paddling himself forward. Seems to be able to turn at least a little bit in the right direction. Well, he's probably going to be able to successfully breed with that weird-looking green dude. He did. Looks like the other one right underneath there is going for the same thing. Yeah, you can see the offspring. It looks like a green thing coming out. What the hell kind of freak is this going to produce? See, the three-limb, two-limb breed created a three-limb, but the same colors as the two-limb. And the locomotion of neither. So that thing got like a amalgam of genetics from both parents. Didn't get it very far though. Yeah, buddy. Dance, buddy. Dance. Woo, yeah. Dance right to nowhere. You can try to go forward, going backwards. Fantastic.
There's that dude that's folding and unfolding right there paddling. I often see the single ones, like the serpent looking ones that you see on the screen now. Those usually do well, but not if they can't turn themselves quickly. I think they do well because that single limb uses a lot less energy to push themselves along. So they burn through their, their food calories a lot slower than multi-limbed creatures. But they also have a tendency to swim in circles sometimes. Like these, the hell are you people doing? Well, there's a few of them now. They've been producing over there. Maybe by sheer luck rather than skill, right? Come on, I need to get you my egg. Come here. There you go. Third time's the charm, Chief. So yeah, you'll get all kinds of critters in the... I mean, maybe at some point I'll uh, introduce some of my other ones, but I think at the finale I have I have a parasite that I evolved. I was talking about that in the intro, and it is a uh, it is a single limbed you know worm serpent type thing. I call it the fire worm. It's all red. Again, it's pretty much a synthetic. It wasn't naturally allowed to evolve in this environment at all. It was I created different environments. I gave it food. I tweaked some of its genetics to make it pretty much the ultimate parasite and with the intention of testing other things that would evolve naturally against it to see, you know, like here, if we let this, these creatures evolve uh, without interference and we find one that is perfectly suited to the environment, will that have an advantage over this parasite red worm creature who's not suited to this environment? You know, can it, can it function in any environment as a parasite or will the one that belongs in the environment be able to um, outlast it and and prosper and keep it from overrunning the pond. So far, I haven't seen anything be able to deal with it. And that's the test that we're doing. Find out. Those guys aren't getting much farther, huh? There are a few of them now. They managed to reproduce, and they have an abundant food supply around them, so they got plenty of energy. That might that might end up being to their advantage. Lucky location, maybe. I don't know. I don't know yet. I'm not sure. Those. It's weird though. They might get. They might just have an advantage because they're really lucky in an area by themselves with food, with creatures of their own kind. At least oddly enough, that might mean that we see more of them popping up here. Not really seeing an abundance of any other particular species. I think the ones in the center. The purplish blue ones, those kind of got lucky. They were maybe close to each other, but they're not moving very much. And movement is life in this game. Well, you got a cluster of people on the top there, too. Look like similar colors. Hmm. Huh. See, food is still maxed out, so we haven't had, once the population gets stable and they're able to find food reliably, you're going to see that graph change dramatically, the food and population graph. Like these, these fold paddlers over here, the ones folding their limbs and paddling with, there's a couple of them. You can see that single-limbed one in the, the top area there chasing that other one because he can't turn himself properly to 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 breed that that's uh being able to turn the body effectively at the right angle is a key attribute speed is good too but you definitely want to be able to move in the correct direction as fast as possible
That's it for this episode of the Darwin Pond Show. Thank you for tuning in, and there'll be a new episode coming soon.